Hello friends, guess where I'm headed today? Israel. How did you know? Israel is obviously one of the most interesting and controversial countries in the world, and I was offered an opportunity to come here and take a tour and see it for myself, so naturally I did. Our adventure begins right here in so-called Old Jerusalem. Jerusalem is of course the most famous city in Israel, but its exact borders are all complicated, and we won't get into that now. But Old Jerusalem is this very distinctive area, about half a square mile right in the middle of the city, isolated from the rest of Jerusalem with fortress-style walls. These were built in the 16th century to protect all of the city's various religious holy sites. You can see here's the Dome of the Rock, which is where the Muslims believe Muhammad ascended to heaven, and the Jews believe the Binding of Isaac happened, if you're familiar with that. They say it's a big hassle to visit, so we won't go there. Instead, here's the Church of the Holy Sepulcher, which houses various important things relating to the final days of Jesus Christ. You can see the stone where his body was said to be anointed before burial, and the supposed spot where he was crucified, which is now this big shrine. You can also queue up to see Jesus' actual tomb. You know, I'm not gonna lie, it's kinda not that busy. You'd think one of the holiest sites in Christianity would be a bit more of a tourist draw. I mean, there was like a bigger lineup for the Blarney Stone in Ireland. Oh man, and uh, check this out. That ladder up there, can you see it? Have you ever heard the story of that ladder? I don't wanna spoil it right now because the channel Real Life Lore has an awesome video about it, but yeah, it is a really wild story. And then there's holy site number three, which is the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. This is the last surviving remnant of what they call the Jews' second temple of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which was destroyed by the Romans almost 2,000 years ago. Orthodox Jewish men pray here constantly. Orthodox Jewish women have to pray behind this gate over here. This one is not as busy as you might expect either. It's not really hard at all to get up close to the wall if you want to pray. And by the way, in case you think I'm being disrespectful by filming videos in front of this holy site, absolutely everyone is doing this. You know, people are taking videos, people are taking photos, people are taking selfies with selfie sticks. The sort of sacredness of the occasion is a little bit undermined by the sort of touristy nature of the attraction. As you travel from one holy site to another in the old city, you go through these little alleyways which unite what they call the four quarters. The Christian quarter, the Muslim quarter, the Jewish quarter, and the Armenian Orthodox quarter, which somehow wound up with its own as well. They're mostly full of tourist shops. All right, so check this out. We are actually at some of the disputed border zone area between Israel and the Palestinian territories. So here is the Palestinian side. That's the city of Bethlehem over there. And then this is the Israeli side containing West Jerusalem. You can see part of the big wall separating the two areas. The wall is part of what they call the security barrier that separates the Palestinian territory of the West Bank from Israel, but we can still pass through it relatively easily. Okay, now we're going through the checkpoint. All right, and here we are on the Palestinian side. The West Bank is actually a surprisingly beautiful place. The landscape is really not what I expected at all. But of course, beyond that, life isn't particularly lovely in Palestine, except, of course, in Rawabi. Rawabi is this sort of crazy Palestinian plan city funded by the Qatari government. It's got all these extravagant high rises that none of the Palestinians actually live in, giving it this kind of creepy ghost town vibe. We've also got this super trendy mall here, lots of brand name stores. Don't really know how sustainable this is as a business model. But you know, it is supposed to sort of serve as a symbolic example of what is theoretically possible in a future Palestinian state. You know, that they can have sort of sophisticated first world uh, shopping amenities just like anywhere else. Big uh, source of employment for the young people, that sort of thing. So we will have to wish them well. You can see they even built this full-size replica of the Roman amphitheater. It's a bit much. This is the River of Jordan right here, the place where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, they say. It is now a major tourist attraction for folks who are interested in being baptized in the same place as Jesus Christ. The River of Jordan also acts as the border between the West Bank and the country of Jordan. Look, you can see some of the Jordanian tourists over there. And then this here is the Sea of Galilee. You guys all know what that is, right? You all read your Bible. It's not actually a sea at all, but rather one of the biggest lakes in the Middle East and an important source of water for the Israelis. There are some recreated ruins around it that are very popular with Christian tourists. We are now at another border zone. You see the fence behind me? That is actually the border between Israel and Lebanon. You can see the Israelis are still working hard to fortify it. And if you want to know why, just look over here. See this yellow flag? That's the flag of the terrorist group Hezbollah. Okay, now we've crossed over into an area called the Golan Heights. 
And if you look behind me, I don't know if you can see, there's like villages and stuff behind there, and that is Syria. This is a weirdly popular tourist spot as well. People like to come to gawk at Syria. It is quite remarkable to be here and to see these places. You know, you hear about places like Syria and Lebanon in the news and stuff. You know, it becomes very abstract. You don't really think of it as a physical, tangible place. It's just kind of something that exists in the abstract on the news. But then when you're here, and you can actually look at these places, you can actually look at the bombed out ruins of cities, it becomes quite emotionally affecting because you realize that, you know, we're talking about real places and real people. It's, it's, it's quite powerful. All right, now we have made it to Tel Aviv, which everybody tells me is Israel's best city. You can see behind me that it's right on the ocean. It's very beautiful, very large coastline with very nice beaches. I must say, it is a little bit different than what I expected. You know, before I came here, I sort of had this idea in my mind of Israel being like this little island of like pure Western culture or pure American culture right in the middle of the Middle East. And while it is that to some degree, it is also a very, very identifiably Middle Eastern country. A city like Tel Aviv is very, very identifiably Middle Eastern in terms of the architecture and just sort of the general aesthetic cultural vibe. You wouldn't walk the streets and think, oh, I'm in Europe or oh, I'm in America. Although I guess West is maybe kind of the key word to emphasize here. I've heard a lot of people say that the sort of the feel of this city reminds them a lot of places in like Southern Europe, sort of more Mediterranean. And, uh, and check out this building here right behind me. This is the birthplace of Israeli independence. This was the place where Israel's first prime minister, David Ben-Gurion, proclaimed the independence of the Jewish state back in 1948. Based on what I've learned so far, the thing that sort of distinguishes Israel's two big cities from each other is that while Jerusalem is like the historic home of the Jewish people and the historic home of the Jewish faith. Tel Aviv, which is a more modern city, is kind of a testament to the success of the modern sort of Zionist dream of building a new Jewish nation. All right, now this is quite a remarkable scene. I am on a kibbutz in Western Israel. And this fence behind me, you see with the barbed wire, that is the border between the Gaza Strip and Israel. Just to summarize quickly, the Palestinian territories consists of two pieces, the West Bank and Gaza. And while the West Bank is a relatively normal place where people can basically come and go, Gaza is an extremely poor and dangerous place, completely walled off from everything. So it's sort of risky having a kibbutz right next door. A kibbutz, by the way, is a sort of Israeli collective farm slash housing co-op popular place for a certain sort of young middle-class Israeli family. Uh, interesting side note, you can see these white posters. Those are all posters, uh, election posters for the Israeli Labour Party. You know, kibbutz, very left-wing politically. When you're in a dangerous part of Israel, you often see these things here, which are these sort of concrete bunkers that you can go into when the bombs start dropping. You can see that it's... Uh, just kind of a big concrete box where basically you can duck and cover until things cool down. This behind me, this is something quite remarkable as well in the kibbutz. You see that behind me there's a number of trees that have been planted. Those trees were actually planted in holes created by mortar fired over from the Gaza Strip. Now we're back in the West Bank and check it out, camel rides. We are now at the Dead Sea. You can see right in the back there. This is an enormous, enormous tourist attraction. Probably the biggest tourist attraction in the entire nation of Israel. You can see now that we are on the top of this vantage point where you can see quite a beautiful view of the sea behind me. You can see that they also have a lot of these really quite remarkable ruins up here. Ruins and recreations of buildings from biblical times, some of them dating to the era of Herod the Great. All right, now we are actually at the Dead Sea itself. As you can see, it's a big sort of fancy resort. These sorts of things are always big fancy resorts. Step one is that you have to get all mudded up. They give you these bags of mud. It supposedly helps your skin or something. You can see this one comes certified by Dr. Mud himself. Okay, we're ready to go. 
So of course the gimmick of the Dead Sea is that the water is impossible to sink in, which is somehow caused by the incredibly high levels of salt in it. It's really a crazy phenomenon. It makes you feel like you're in outer space. One thing I was not prepared for, however, is just how viciously sharp the beach is. It's basically a whole beach made of shards of rock hard salt crystals. And you can see huge deposits of calcified salt everywhere too. You can see that my hair is not wet at all. And that is because you cannot put your head in the water. The water is so salty that it is like almost sort of acidic or sort of poisonous like. Like, you know, I can put my, ah, I can put my finger to my mouth and it is so bad tasting. You have no idea. So if you put your head in the water, you know, you get any of this in your eyes, you get any of this in your mouth, it is like so, so painful. So it is just not done. I actually have a small little cut on my foot, which was quite painful to put in the water as well, just because the salt volume is so high. It is at a level where it really sort of ceases to even be identifiably like salt at all, as opposed to just like some very corrosive substance. So you can't really like, you know, have a fun little splashy, splashy swim. It's really just kind of a gimmicky thing where you just go in and notice how hard it is to sink. And lastly, we have arrived at the final stop, Haifa, here in northern Israel. This is another very picturesque city right on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. During the period of Turkish rule, Haifa used to be one of the major port cities of the Ottoman Empire. And to this day, the area is the most Arab-heavy part of Israel, if you don't count the Palestinian areas. You can see that right in the center of town, right here, there is a big Baha'i temple. The greater Haifa area is home to some of the largest Arab communities in the country, including Akko and Nazareth. It's here where you'll see a lot of very stereotypically Middle Eastern sites, like these bustling Arab marketplaces and these narrow maze-like city streets. During the Crusades, it was this area where the European Christians tried to establish the home base of their new Middle Eastern empire, and there's still a lot of Crusader monuments and tourist trinkets. And talking of tourist trinkets, no JJ trip to an exotic foreign land could be complete without a few souvenirs. So here are a few weird Israeli things that I purchased while I was here. First one is this pencil case. It is done up in the style of a very popular Israeli snack food. These little peanut flavored puffs with the baby mascot. Long time viewers will know that one of my viewers once sent me a real live package of this snack food in the mail. So it has always had a very large role in my imagination of Israel. But every Israeli person that I've met said it is indeed a very iconic Israeli thing. One person told me that this is why you don't see a lot of Israeli kids with peanut allergies, because they're scarfing down so much of this stuff. Speaking of snacks, the time that I'm in Israel right now is very close to the Jewish holiday of Purim. It is sort of like their Israeli Halloween, except from what I understand, instead of trick-or-treating, you're just kind of given snacks by your friends and family. You can buy Purim snacks in these pre-packaged little containers. This one got a little mangled in my bag. But you can see this little character on the package here with his little Purim dress-up hat. This is actually one of the most iconic Purim candies, which is this very particular sort of triangular cookie. I wrote down the name. It is called the Ozen Aman or Aman's Ear. I think this is a reference to some biblical story I'm not super familiar with. But I must say, they are really awesome cookies. And of course, you can wash it down with this little thing of holy water, which I bought at the baptismal site. The amount of tacky christian theme stuff you can buy in Israel is really quite remarkable, so I just had to get something. I also got this which is very, very common in Israel, but I have to confess I was not familiar with it before I came here. I have heard it referred to as the Hand of Fatima. It is basically just a sort of good luck symbol. You see it all over the place. It is apparently a symbol that is beloved by both Jews and Muslims alike. Its exact origins seem kind of hazy. If you're familiar with it, let me know. I just had to get one because it is just so everywhere. This other little thing is very everywhere as well. I'm a little bit more familiar with this because my sister lives in the Middle East and she has brought home souvenirs with this thing on it before. They call it the evil eye, but it is not actually evil. In fact, it is supposed to protect you from the evil eye. This is another sort of thing where its exact origins seem to have been somewhat lost to history. And now it's just kind of a generic good luck symbol beloved by Jews and Muslims. And then I got this set of coasters. You might recognize the style of these things. There is a famous Israeli uh, artist who has made quite the splash on social media, drawing sort of hipster-fied versions of famous world leaders of history. The fellow's name is Amit Shimoni. I can see because it says on the back here. Anyway, this is a set that I bought, which are the sort of hipster depictions of the sort of founding fathers of Israel. So we have Theodore Herzl, we have David Ben-Gurion, 
We have Golda Meir, we have Moishi Dayan, and we have Mahatman Begum. Bought these in Tel Aviv, in an area of the town where a lot of the sort of historical things happened. They call it the Independence Trail. And lastly, talking of history, there is nothing I enjoy buying more when I'm visiting a foreign country than a book for children about that country. I like to buy books that teach the children how to be a patriotic citizen of whatever that country is. I think it's very interesting to see how patriotism is sort of marketed and sold to children. So this book is about various patriotic episodes of Israeli history, illustrated with patriotic Israeli music. One of those books where you press the buttons and the music comes out. So thank you very much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed my trip to Israel as much as I did. Do not forget to like and subscribe, and I will see you all next week.